Today, I have a simple question for you. What happens when a virtual plant-based bio beats lava and fire? The answer may surprise you. Or may not. But trust me, you can do better than that. For those of you who are new here, this is Biomaker CA, a biomaker project where I use complex artificial intelligence models called neural cellular automata to create complex ecosystems of plants. What you see there are plant cells specializing in leaves, roots and flowers to survive and reproduce with variation. Each organism has their own unique DNA shared across their own cells. Besides certain cells, there are more materials such as earth and air, essential for plant survival. If any of these has piqued your interest, feel free to check the playlist linked above for many more details. Today, we will add lava and fire to the simulation and see how plants fare against it. Let's start with fire, since its role is quite clear. Fire, if in contact with leaf, flower or unspecialized cells, can transform them into fire. It only affects one neighbor per step, and the actual chance is 1 8 for each step, because I'm kind of lazy. Note that roots are unaffected by fire. I did it because it would have been weird to burn underground, but it also gives plants a way to fight back. Fire is subject to gravity, so it falls vertically. Finally, fire ages. After a certain age, 10 steps in our simulation, it has a certain chance, here 20%, of extinguishing itself and becoming void. Now, lava is a more stable material. It also ages and eventually expires into void, but much more slowly. In these experiments, it can only expire after 200 steps, with a 5% chance at each step after 200. What does it do? Well, primarily, it falls. It is subject to gravity and also implements a falling sound algorithm, meaning that if it can't fall sideways, it does that. Now, if it cannot fall to the side, only then it looks at its neighborhood for evil deeds. Specifically, it can transform leaves, flowers and unspecialized cells into fire. Again, only one per step and with a 1 8 chance of hitting a specific neighbor. So, the intended behavior is to have lava as something to beware of and fire as the after effect of not reacting properly. I want to stress out that it is absolutely possible for plants to survive when in contact with lava and fire. First, lava wants to fall so certain shapes would have lower chances to be ignited. There are some caveats, but that's the general rule. Second, you can just expose roots next to lava or fire to avoid being ignited. So, plants have no excuses. They can survive, I think. Do they though? Well, let's see. I will show you two initial ways of testing our initial plant DNAs when facing lava. The first kind is a frequent lava approach. Lava will constantly fall, with a very low chance at every step. However, the chance will increase regularly. Note that the lava is generated out of nowhere. Alternatively, we could design some generator materials that create lava periodically, but I haven't gotten to do it yet. In this video, for the agent models I will use an extended agent logic, with adaptive mutators. If you are interested in such details, consider checking out previous videos. But, as a refresher, this means that each cell has possibly very complex behaviors, and mutations during reproduction can be arbitrarily small or big. Let's start with our traditional initial DNA, and initialize the adaptive mutator to very low values. This tells us pretty much how well our original DNA behaves without evolving, well, much. The results are in, and they are... awful. Okay. The next test is with a wave-based approach. Lava will fall on a regular interval, all in one, with increasing amounts at every interval. It's not too bad, but now let's see what happens when we have higher initial mutation rates, the usual default value. In the frequent lava test, they perform much better, showing that plants actually do evolve even in these short experiments, which is cool. But the wave test doesn't show any improvement, alas. Now, to improve on that, I tried various experiments of meta-evolution, where I simulate many environments and evolve DNAs by looking at the behavior of entire populations. If you're curious about this, 
The previous video about tiny worlds uses them extensively. Here I failed. I didn't spend too much time on it, but it looks promising. For instance, here is a failed attempt at evolving robust plants on a Petri world. They are close to being good, but here, for example, I didn't manage to get them to reproduce, so they are doomed to die. Something with meta-evolution can absolutely be done here, and I leave it to you as a challenge. Can you meta some amazing DNA for this lava-infested configuration called eruption? Instead, I went into another direction this time, that really surprised me. I wanted to decrease the size of the environment to save computation, and possibly increase the width significantly. For reference, the height of the environment shown until now is 72. So, since in a previous video, linked above, I showed that the initial model fails in environments with height of 16, I tried to go with only half the size of 72. 36. This is the result. I even tried it directly on a wider environment, since that helps, and still it failed completely. Therefore, I said to myself, Hey, we already have a model that works on tiny environments. Why not trying to put that exact DNA, discovered in a 16 height world, into a 36 height one? Here, a first hurdle appeared. The tiny DNA, I'll call it that from now on, is not directly compatible to this new environment. It is not a matter of height, it is indifferent to that. And as you can see, it works perfectly fine on taller environments, which is great. The problem is that this new set of environments contains two more material types, and the agent logic that we are using does require different DNAs to work. But there are ways to circumvent that. For instance, we can simply extend the original DNA to have a default behavior with these new materials. I've wrote a function that converts that for you. Feel free to use it, but notice that it currently only covers the use case of extending the number of materials. More options can be added, but the code is already complex as it is. This very much suggests me that we should quickly change our agent logics to be more friendly to extensibility. Back to the topic at hand. So I extended tiny DNA to work on eruption. Note that I will use an adaptive mutator like with the other DNAs, which I haven't tried on tiny DNA yet. Let's start with a very low initial mutation rate, just like before. As you can see, I am showing a 36 height environment first. The frequency experiment is already promising, but hold on, look at the wave test. It almost survives the 100% wave. And this was starting with a very low mutation rate. See what happens with higher mutation rates? Even the frequency test is severely improved upon. And the wave test is passed entirely. If you're curious, TinyDNA works even better on a 72 height environment, as you can see here. From a researcher perspective, this is probably the most promising result I've observed in Biomaker CA so far, because it is unexpected. Why would training for survival in small worlds make it work so well in eruption? We couldn't have predicted it without trying it. This is one of the core principles of novelty search and open-endedness. Sometimes, doing random things work better than trying to optimize for it. I couldn't make it work with meta-evolution directly, but this works marvelous. Now we are ready to introduce the true form of eruption, and my challenge to you. It is a very wide environment, split in three parts. The center is normal, and it is the starting point of life. In the left, waves of lava can randomly occur. This makes it harder than the test we did before, where waves happened at a regular interval. However, here waves become more oppressive the further west you go, so it is an incremental challenge. On the right, we have frequent lava dropping, just like in our tests. Here as well, the further east you go, the more frequent lava becomes, making it harder and harder to survive. The height doesn't matter much to me, pick your poison. The width will be the same regardless. My challenge is obvious, create the most successful biome possible in eruption. To give you a benchmark, here is tiny DNA. First, let's see how it performs with a height of 36. It starts very well, but it ultimately saturates left and right with Earth. I read in the comments that many of you dislike this behavior, and I agree with you. 
This is clearly undesirable. I mean, it is the plant's fault, ultimately, that they cause this. But the environment may be improved to favor interesting life. And that is what we ultimately care about. Perhaps we need to think about how to have some stabilizing effects on the environment too. Or explore closed energy systems. Until then, let me leave you with a 72 height run of tiny DNA on eruption. This run appears to be slightly more resistant to this soil generation behavior, but it still doesn't look like it really solved it. Not how mutations do occur, but whatever is going on is not good enough, I think, for mastering this environment. Can you do better? As always, if you like what you see, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If there is enough interest, I can create a Discord channel or something similar to have the community discuss ideas and showcase results. Let me know in the comments or on Twitter, linked in the description. Until then, feel encouraged to ping me on Twitter for any experiments performed. Until next time, 